This is Curl Up with a Cat Tail, and I'm Gwen Cooper, the New York Times bestselling author of numerous cat-centric titles, including Homer's Odyssey, A Fearless Feline Tale, or How I Learned About Love and Life with a Blind Wonder Cat, Spray Anything, More True Tales of Homer and the Gang, and The Book of Possum, Head Bonks, Raspy Tongues, and 101 Reasons Why Cats Make Us So, So Happy. We're here to celebrate all things feline and to tell inspirational cat tales. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to a new episode of Curl Up with a Cat Tail with Gwen Cooper. I'm, of course, Gwen Cooper, your host, and delighted as always to be here with you. Later on in today's episode, you can hear the second half of our interview with Cy Montgomery, New York Times bestselling author and famed naturalist, um, author of books including The Soul of an Octopus and the memoir How to Be a Good Creature. But first, I will be answering a question today from reader Nicole McCarthy. And as always, if you guys have any questions that or comments that you would like to hear me answer or address on future episodes of Curl Up with a Cat Tail, head on over to GwenCooper.com. That is my website. And you can either leave a comment on the page on my, po- on my website that's dedicated to my podcast or... Or you can hit the contact form and shoot me an email. Or you can just send me an email directly via Gwen at GwenCooper.com. But uh, please reach out. I would love to hear from you. Um, As I said, today's question is from reader Nicole McCarthy. And Nicole McCarthy is um, addressing something that I had discussed on an earlier episode of this show when I had talked about a lot of the institutional resistance and and kind of just general disparagement within mainstream publishing toward a woman writing about cats and about relationships with cats. And so Nicole's question, and, and this, by the way, as I discussed in that podcast, is the main reason why I have decided to move from publishing with traditional publishers to publishing independently and have asked listeners to to help me in this endeavor by supporting me on Patreon. And and I've talked about Patreon a lot, so I'm not going to talk about it again right now. But Nicole's question was that if all of that is the case, and and if it is, you know, a grave enough situation, that I would think about leaving traditional publishing for independent publishing after a decade of publishing traditionally, um, why I wouldn't just consider writing about something else that might be more marketable. And I do want to say I'm not phrasing Nicole's question, I, I think, very well, because it, now that I'm saying it, it sounds a little like uh, like, like smart alecky, like, well, why don't you just write about something else then? And I really don't think that's it. I think she was genuinely interested in knowing why I have not sort of caved to industry pressure on this topic and and started writing about something other than cats, something that might be looked upon more favorably by editors and by bookstores as opposed to writing books about cats. And um, and I thought it was a fair question because it's something that I've talked about a lot on this show, but I have never really addressed that one issue. Why am I so insistent on writing about cats? Uh, because I have been pretty candid in saying that when I was thinking about writing Homer's Odyssey, it really was initially from a combination of feeling both that I could – this was a great story about a cat that I could tell and also a feeling that I could sell this story, that based on the success of the the proposal about the book, you know, for the book about doing the library cat, that I might see some professional and financial success writing about Homer – in addition to the feeling that I could tell a good story. So if my sense is that 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 professional and financial success is no longer a possibility, why don't I just write about something else? Um, and it's a fair question, I think. And of course, my first answer would be that, you know, it was one thing 10 years ago when I had written more than 10 years ago. Gosh, at this point, I mean, we're going back 14 years um, it was pretty soon after I published my first novel, which was a novel about South Beach, not about cats in 2007, that I read about the proposal selling for the book about Dewey the Library Cat and decided to try to sell a proposal for a book about Homer. And so 14 years ago, I was at a much more flexible point, I guess, in my career. It's not just that I was 14 years younger, 
But I only had one book under my belt. And and so the future was, was kind of a, a wide open poo-poo platter of possibilities. I now am at a point where I've spent 14 years writing about cats and and building up an audience among cat lovers and communicating with so many of you and, and starting things like my Curl Up with a Cat Tail short story series and this podcast. And so I'm I'm pretty entrenched at this point. And it's kind of like the feeling, you know, it's one thing you might not resent. Let's say you, you've just moved into an apartment and something happens and, and you have to leave that apartment a month later. You know, it was an apartment, you were renting it, you know, you, you haven't been there very long. You probably don't feel particularly attached to it. Whereas if this is your homestead, if this is, let's say, your farm that that started as nothing and you have spent 14 years taking a scrubby little patch of land and turning it into a green, lush, beautiful farm that that yields lucrative crops and and where you have a flower garden planted and where you have lived and you're and you, and planted your heart basically for 14 years you would probably feel a lot more resentful about somebody coming along and trying to force you to leave and so that would be my first answer uh is that the the main reason why I have not wanted to try to do something else or to write about something else that might be more lucrative is or, or more appealing, let's say, to mainstream publishers is because I've been here for 14 years. I have been on this land and and no one's going to run me off this land. I, I came out here as a homesteader when it was nothing. There were no famous cats on the internet. There was only one book about a cat that had been published. And in that time, all of these things have grown up around me and I will be, uh, pardon my language, but I will be damned. If I'm going to be run off uh, because somebody has decided that I am no longer the flavor of the moment. And I think that there is a value actually for my career. I mean, just as a matter of principle, I wouldn't do it. And I also think that as a matter of of earning a living, you know, people who jump from thing to thing end up jumping around forever. And I think there's value in in being dedicated to one thing and becoming good at it and sticking with it. And so that is is definitely a big part of the reason, as is the fact that I love telling stories about my cats. You know, what started as kind of an idea for one book that I thought might sell has really grown into a real passion for me. I love writing stories about my cats. I love talking to all of you. I love hearing from all of you. I love having you write into me. And tell me stories about your cats or, or contact me via social media. I love that that you privilege me by sharing your photos, your your memories, your anecdotes. I, I love this community. I, I have really grown to love this. Again, my I, I have planted not just my, my cash crops, but my heart is planted in this soil. And I don't want to leave. I, I don't want to go try to start writing about something else. If that impulse ever comes to me, I will certainly follow it. But for now, I, I don't feel like I am done talking to all of you on this subject or having you talk to me on this subject. So those are the two main reasons why I, I've really never seriously considered changing my focus and and trying to move more with the trends now that the trend for pet memoir, you know, there was a trend toward pet memoir a decade ago. The industry has kind of moved away from that and why I'm not trying to follow those trends away from it as well. But, you know, th- there's one story I think that really, a, a kind of upsetting news story um, that really exemplifies why I'm so adamant on this issue. And some of you may have heard this, and and I'm going to tell it as as succinctly as possible and try not to dwell on upsetting details. Uh, But there was a story that came out of Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Some of you may have have followed or or may be following Ponzu the cat on Instagram. And that's spelled P-O-N-Z-U. And Ponzu was a cat who lived in Brooklyn uh, with another cat and a dog and a parrot and, and this little you know, kind of ragtag animal family was very popular on Instagram. And on Easter Sunday 
uh, Ponzu's owner was walking him in the park on a leash, as she always did, along with her dog, her parrot, and her boyfriend. They were out on Easter Sunday taking a walk. A 12-year-old child attacked the cat while she was walking him. Um, There are a lot of conflicting details about the nature of the attack, but apparently he tried to drag and throw the cat. um, The the cat's claws were actually ripped out. And the cat, Ponzu, had an underlying heart condition and, and died on the scene. Ponzu died. And Ponzu's owner, of course, began yelling and screaming at this child, this this 12-year-old who had attacked her cat, at which point the child's family, the 12-year-old's family, uh, three or four grown adults, surrounded Ponzu's owner and her boyfriend and it viciously attacked the two of them and, and beat them fairly severely. The boyfriend actually had to have emergency surgery the next day. You can go online and look for more details. I I don't want to dwell on this too much. And so one of the adults who attacked, you know, Ponzu's boy, Ponzu's owner and her boyfriend has been arrested. But among the many things that that are and, and really this is being written about and discussed from every conceivable angle. But one thing that is not lost on me is that nothing They know who the 12-year-old child who attacked the cat is, and right now it does not appear that any legal action is being taken against this child. And let me just say, first off, I understand that a 12-year-old is a child. I do not want to whip up an internet mob howling for the blood of a 12-year-old. And I am also aware that while it is true that a 12-year-old who is capable of attacking and killing a cat is very likely to become a 21-year-old who will be le- capable of attacking and killing a human being. I am not at all confident that our broken juvenile justice system is in a good position to intervene and and keep that from happening. You know, that, that if the child were arrested and sent to juvenile hall and punished, that this would in any way halt his trajectory toward becoming an adult sociopath. I am not at all confident that that would be the case. It's not I'm not angry that nobody is per, is trying to to squeeze a pound of flesh out of this 12-year-old for what he did. I understand that many of you listening will be I get it. I I'm not even saying that I disagree with you. It's just not my point. My point is not that nothing not enough is being done to punish this 12-year-old. It's that nothing is being done because all he did quote unquote, you know, it was only a cat. All he did was attack a cat. It was only a cat. If he was a 12-year-old who had attacked and injured or killed a a two-year-old child, there would be no question that more would be done. And again, I I don't want to get into the issue of what's more valuable or which life is more important, a cat's or a child's. And I will even concede the argument that children are more important than cats, just for the sake of not having to have that argument. But that is not to say that cats and dogs, and, and that our relationships with, with animals, that they are nothing. And it seems to me that, they're, that the publishing industry doesn't want to take stories about women and their cats seriously for the same reason that society as a whole still does not treat these relationships as serious. I think that in some ways, cats have really come into their own over the past decade. Again, there there are cat influencers on Instagram, and there's Grumpy Cat and Funny Cat videos and and books like I Could Pee on This. But cats aren't just jokes, and they're not just memes. And God knows I love to laugh at my cats. I write humor about cats. My books about my cats, about my relationships with my cats, are are at least as humorous and affectionate as they are serious. But I they are real relationships. Cats are not just punchlines to jokes. The relationships we have with them are real. It is a horrible, horrible thing what happened to this woman. 
And it's not just horrible because she was injured or because she lost a piece of property, you know, or, or, or a po- piece of property that she was especially fond of. It's a real relationship that we have with our cats. These are real emotional bonds and they deserve to be taken seriously. And I am not harboring any delusions that I can single handedly change the way society thinks or change the world. And I also understand that I'm pretty much preaching to the choir because the people reading my books and reading the things that I write are people who already agree with me. If you are the kind of person who thinks that cats are silly or people who like cats are silly or that cats are fine, but you know, it's not like they're important. It's not, e- they're not even as important as dogs. I mean, the relationships we have with them, they're not real relationships. If you're a person who feels that way, you're not going to read anything I write, much less be persuaded by anything that I write. But I think it's important for sometimes, you know, we all know the feeling of of having lost a cat we love and having everyone around us, coworkers, friends, family members, even people who love us and who are well-meaning, not really understand why it hurts as much, why it's real grief, why we don't just get over it, why we don't just go get another cat. Certainly, you, you cannot take time off of your job to to mourn for the loss of your cat. That That's not a recognized thing. And I think, you know, sometimes you, you might, I mean, at least I know that I have sometimes it, it's almost like being gaslighted. You start to wonder, am I nuts to care as much as I do and, and to invest emotionally in this animal as much as I have? And I think we all need the reassurance of knowing sometimes that, that yes, it, it is a real relationship. You are not crazy for feeling the way you do. You are not foolish for loving as much as you do or for taking it as seriously as you do. And I like to think that in, in writing stories that, yes, are, are humorous and affectionate, but then also treat the bond that we have with our cats as serious, even if my entire industry <laughs> does not believe that they're serious. I like to think that I make it a little bit easier. Bo- I mean, I know I for myself and, and I hope for people who read my story to hold on to this idea that it's they're not being silly. It's everyone else who's wrong. It's the people who think you're silly who are wrong. You're not silly and you're not wrong for taking it seriously. Other people are wrong for treating you like it's serious, like it's silly and like it's not worth taking seriously. And the more we can, the more validation we get in hanging on to that idea, I I think the more we will eventually persuade society as a whole, you don't have to agree with us. You just have to acknowledge that it's a real thing. I, I remember like 30 years ago, if you were a vegan, people thought you were nuts. You you were like some pot smoking hippie living on a commune somewhere. And it was this really fringe thing. And now, not obviously, you don't have to be a vegan. And, and I don't want to wade into this particular debate. But we, it's become much more mainstream. Nobody looks at it, I think, anymore as as something ridiculous or out there or, or like it's it's a lifestyle choice from another planet. And I think that's in part because people stuck to their guns and said, this is something we care about. This is something we believe. This is something we do. You don't have to do it with us, but you do have to accept that we are actually really committed to this idea. And I really believe that that is the only way that we are going to come to a point as a society where in a situation like this, the police will understand that it's not just a question. Society will understand, yes, we want to catch and and deal with the individuals who attacked the people in this situation, but we also want to treat the matter of the murdered cat as a real matter and not as property damage that's incidental to the to what happened. This is the heart of what happened. This is the worst part of this thing that happened, and that deserves to be acknowledged. And so this is usually the part where I would make the big pitch asking you to go to my Patreon page and to help support my work and my continued writing independently of traditional publishers. And and I certainly look please do so. It's Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com slash Gwen Cooper. Uh, but today I'm going to encourage you to to go look up this story. It's Ponzu P O N Z U the Cat Her family has started a GoFundMe or his family has started a GoFundMe for their legal fees because they are pursuing legal action against the people who have injured them. 
So I would encourage you, you know, maybe instead of of joining my Patreon that you go and and you give $5 or $10 or whatever you can afford to Ponzu's legal fund. And if you would, would prefer not to do that, if you feel that maybe enough people have already given to Ponzu's legal fund, or if it's not quite your speed in terms of the kinds of donations that you like to make, then I would say that somewhere in your city, your county, your state, somewhere there is at least one scrappy little no-kill cat shelter that is pretty much hangs together on a shoestring budget and that only exists because of, of the intense love and dedication of a small beleaguered group of volunteers. There is at least one organization that meets that description somewhere, hopefully within a couple hundred miles of you. Find that organization Give them $5, give them $10, give them whatever you can spare. Because all of us who take cats seriously, all of us who take these relationships seriously, all of us who love to laugh at our cats and at cats in general, but who know deep down that that our cats are are the innermost hearts of our hearts. All of us who know that we we have to stick together, man. We we have to support each other because that is the only way that we are ever going to be taken seriously. And nobody knows better than our guest on today's episode how important it is to take those relationships with animals seriously. I'm speaking, of course, of National Book Award finalist, New York Times bestselling author, and famed naturalist Cy Montgomery. Uh, Coming up is going to be part two of my interview with Cy Montgomery. The first part of the interview is on last week's episode. And if you haven't heard it yet, I would encourage you to go back and listen, if not to the whole episode at least to that first part of the interview. And then come on back here, get comfortable, hang out, because we will be back in just a few moments with part two of that interview with Simon Montgomery and more Curl Up with a Cat Tail. You know, I think it's um I, I think I, I always feel that nobody has a, a stronger sense of, of right or wrong or fair and and versus unfair than a small child. You know, kids kids know what, what's you know, it, it's not fair that this one gets to stay up later than me, or I told the truth and you're accusing me of lying, and that's not fair, and that's not there, there's no burning outrage like like there isn't a small child, and if you are a small child who loves animals. I, I think you always have this sense of it's not fair that that people are treating animals or, or either treating this one animal who I know, or even when you just hear about animals, like you, to your point and in, in read in the newspaper or see in movies, um, you just have this burning sense of the unfairness of it. That, oh, yeah. that it's not, well, that I, it's just, I was it's not right. out of school my first day of kindergarten. And why? Because I had bitten a little boy because he had pulled the legs off of daddy long legs and I bit him. Well, well, good for you. I, 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 <laughs> I remember, I remember a field trip actually. That's so funny. I remember a field trip. Um, it, it was like camp. We went to some, so it was like a lake with a kind of beach, you know, not, a, not the, the beach, not the ocean, but, but a big lake with a beach and we weren't swimming or anything. I don't know exactly what we were doing, but there were all these little, little tiny frogs and like, like there were some kids who were, you know, building like, like these kind of like, like elaborate, you know, like moats and things and filling them with water for the frogs. So like these little tiny frogs to kind of hang out and play in, which was one thing. But then of course, right. There's always like a couple of jerky kids who are just being mean to the frogs in various ways. And, um, and I being me threw rocks at them and, and, um, and I got in trouble. And again, this, this goes back to like a seven-year-old sense of justice. Like, how am I the one getting in trouble when I was defending these frogs who weren't bothering anybody who weren't doing anything wrong from these kids who were trying to hurt them? God, where and- were you when I was growing up? <laughs> I think we need to go back in time and be best friends. <laughs> it would have been nice to have had someone, you know, my, 
my parents got it. I mean, especially again, my, my dad, who is such an animal lover, he got it, but they were like, just, you know, tell a teacher next time and don't throw rocks. But, uh, I still stand by my actions. Some tails. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I wasn't throwing like huge rocks that, you know, just, just little rocks, little child size rocks. But I feel this leads very naturally into a discussion of your book, How to Be a Good Creature, um, which I just love. And there are two, there are two editions of this book. Is is that correct? Well, I I wrote one book, a picture book called Becoming a Good Creature. Okay. Which has different animals and kind of some different stories in it. Just because the adult version, which it which is a, a memoir in 13 animals does discuss some adult themes there's there was some child abuse that's briefly discussed there's um the the year i was going to suicide and little kids don't need to read that but little kids have really important life lessons to learn too and animals are there to help them so um becoming a good creature has different and more animals and kind of some different lessons than the, the 13 individuals who I talk about in how to be a good creature. You know, I, I have spoken myself on, on this podcast actually about um, suicidal ideation and depression. And, and I've heard a lot from, from listeners a, after talking about those. And, and for me, you know, a, a big part. And, and I said, you know, the, the, the really insidious thing about depression is, is that it is a cruel voice that lives in your head and tells you lies, but it sounds, it speaks to you in your own voice. And, and that makes it sound truthful. Mm. Um, and, and it can come very close to convincing you that everyone would be better off without you. And, and what I said was that the one thing it could never quite convince me of was that my cats would be better off without me, especially my cat Clayton, who who really just lives his entire, the the entire point of his existence appears to be to be in as close a physical proximity to me at all times as he possibly can. He's he's actually in my lap right now. Oh, he's living the dream. He's always, (laughs) he's always, it's, he, he, um, when I had, I had COVID uh, way back at the beginning of this, and, oh my God. and, and this was like, there'd have been a new story about a cat. I mean, it was not terrible at no point did I feel like I was going to die. It was, it, you know, it was not that dramatic, but I of course was trying to quarantine in my house and there, there'd been a new story about a cat who had gotten right. COVID. So we didn't know at the time, you know, it was still really early in things if, if maybe ah. I was endangering the cats. And so I was quarantining away from my husband and the cats and, and that lasted for all of about 15 minutes before Clayton had gouged such a hole in the wood of the door that I was like, we're we're not going to get, it's just, we're not going to get through 10 days like this. We're we're just not (laughs) like we, 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 we have to let him in. But I guess the question I would have for you is, would you say something similar for yourself that, that it, again, I don't want to get too far into the, the mystical qualities of animals, but that there is something unique about those relationships that makes it, that that makes it i don't want to say easier but they they have a, a a higher likelihood let's say of pulling you back from the brink sometimes yeah absolutely absolutely what they do is they make you fall back in love with life and when i had lost all hope it was because i had lost my animals christopher hogwood had died tess had died this happened with within just a couple months of each other. And it, it felt like my life, everything that, it, that, that I loved was gone. Of course, you know, it wasn't, I, I had friends who loved me. My husband loved me. Um, but my animals, heart of my heart were gone. And um, what pulled me back, was an expedition that I did. I mean, I, I keep my promises and I had promised to write the good, good pig and a contract for that. So I was going to do it. I also had a contract for a scientist in the field book about my, my friend, Dr. Lisa Daybeck's 
project studying Machis tree kangaroos in the Huon Peninsula of Papua New Guinea. And I had promised to do that. So I was going to fulfill those promises. And up in the cloud forest, amongst all these amazing animals that looked like something that Dr. Seuss had made up while he was tripping on LSD. I mean, it was like a, a Dakin toy meets Dr. Seuss. The animals up there were just unbelievable. Even tree kangaroos, you know, the fact that there are real kangaroos that live in the trees and they eat orchids and they're orange and yellow. I mean, oh my gosh. That, that does sound very Seussian. <laughs> orange and yellow kangaroos who live in trees. It, it definitely, uh, it does, or, 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 or very surreal, you know, like, like, something, like, you, like you, you're describing a weird dream you had there's to a friend. There's species of these, these creatures. The matches is just one of them. But up in this cloud forest that was visited only by these researchers and the people in the village below who who helped them. Um, it just made me fall back in love with life. You also have, um, and, and you were telling me a little bit about this before, but uh, a story about uh, your, your border collie, Thurber, who you wrote about in How to Be a Good Creature. I believe he, he's, the, he's the final chapter, if I'm remembering he is. correctly. He is. Yes. And, and how he also uh, sort, sort of pulled you, pulled you back in. Oh, totally. Well, everyone I tell this story to just can't believe it. It's just the most amazing thing. Um, Our border collie after Tess was Sally, and she had, like Sally, been rescued, and we loved her with her whole heart. She developed a brain tumor, and just weeks after I returned from the book tour for Soul of an Octopus, the brain tumor had pretty much destroyed her, and our our vet came to our bedroom, and while I held her, he gave her the shot that ended her life. And, and I thought, oh man, you know, here we go again. I'm going to be spiraling to this horrible depression. Well, it wasn't even very many weeks after that. that the vet called me and he said, I've got a whole bunch of Dave Kennard's puppies here. Now I knew Dave. Dave raised champion border collies who did not go to be pets in people's home. They were all professional herders. People paid thousands of dollars for his dogs because they were brilliant. And every one of them ends up at a home where they are herding sheep or cattle or pigs, or they're, they're chasing um, Canada geese off golf course. They're all working dogs. He will not sell you a dog as a pet. And we weren't in the market yet for a pet. And we certainly weren't looking for a puppy. And if we'd been looking for a a dog, it would have been a female adult rescue black and white. Well, one of the puppies born to this storied group of dogs was perfectly healthy, but he had one blind eye. And our veterinarian Chuck said, would you take him? And I didn't think I was ready. And my husband didn't think he was ready. But we went just to take a look. And we named him Thurber <laughs> after James Thurber. And this guy, this dog, oh my gosh, Gwen, I, I wish you could meet him. I mean, maybe when we all have our shots. Um, he's the most perfect being ever created in the world. He is so much fun. He loves everybody. He is so eager to please. He was the easiest puppy to train. He's so happy all the time. He actually sings. He sings in the car. I discovered there's certain songs he likes to sing to. Uh, oddly, he, he's crazy about this one, like Christian rock group, this one song. He just <laughs> loves it. And he throws his, his head back and he howls. And I howl with him. And the whole passenger side of the front seat is covered with nose prints from him throwing his face, you know, up to, to, to sing with joy. Sometimes in the summer, the windows are down and people in Hancock, New Hampshire can tell that Cy and Thurber are coming through town. <laughs> and he has so many friends. You have to roll up the windows when you're going through hospital zones, I would imagine. Oh, right. <laughs> But I mean, you just can't be around him and not smile. He has this great um, 
it, probably the same mutation that gave him his his blind eye. I like to say he has one good eye and one blessed eye because it's the blind blessed eye that brought him to it to us. But probably the same mutation that caused that eye to be blind causes the typical blaze on a border collie's nose to look like a Z on him, like <laughs> like a, a bolt of lightning. But like and a Harry Potter kind of thing. He is like a Harry <laughs> Potter. I mean, he's, he's a wizard. He's so much fun. He loves to play with toys. He loves to play with other dogs. He loves people. He's far more friends than I do. And he's made me so many friends. <laughs> I was, uh, we, we had a dog when I was growing up. She was, uh, she was, you know, she, I mean, so all of our dogs were rescues and she, um, she looked just like a purebred Cocker Spaniel, except she never got bigger than a puppy size. So she was a very cute little thing. Oh. And um, she was obsessed with the, the Jeopardy music that they play during Final Jeopardy, you know, when the contestants are are writing in their answers Oh and, yeah, and she she loved to sing along to that, and and it was the same thing. She would throw back her little head and just oh. howl and howl, <laughs> and, so and it made funny. it hard for us. And we're like, we're trying to think of the answer, you know. But did you and, howl uh, with her? No, <laughs> no, I, I the cannot. Coral thing. They really love it if you howl with them. You know, I will be honest and say it did not occur to us to do so. Um, the other dogs, we, we had two other dogs at the time. We just kind of look at her like, what's her problem? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, well, and you know, dogs like that. I mean, what they teach you and what, what Thurber showed me was at the point where I just thought, oh my God, everything is terrible. <laughs> my life is terrible my life is ruined and how did I know right around the corner there was something so glorious and wonderful and that's kind of the lesson that you just never know just keep breathing and there's going to be something wonderful Waiting. No, they, they, there really is that, you know, and, and again, I don't like to get too far in, into the mystical qualities of anything, but it does seem to me that at those moments, I mean, certainly Homer came to me at a moment in my life where I, I felt, you know, I had lost my, my home, my job, my fiance, you know what I mean? All yeah. within the span of, of a week. And then somebody came to me, uh, my, my veterinary came to me with this blind kitten and, and I was, you know, sleeping on a friend's couch basically with the two cats I already had. And, I remember um, that. and, and really it certainly w- w- did not have the feeling that something great was just around the corner. You know, you know, that was uh, not, not a moment in my life where I would have believed that. And, and yet there was, they, they do seem to come to us. I, I also find it very telling and, and I love because I, I feel like there's so many adoption stories that I hear where at some point the person says, you know, so I, I wouldn't commit to the adoption, but I said, all right, I'll come down and meet him. And <laughs> which I've never heard. I've never heard a person say, I said, I would go down and meet him. And then I met him and I was like, you know what? I'm going to pass. It, yeah. it never, <laughs> never, ever happens. And it, and it just seems like it's almost like, like this passive aggressive thing that we, we, or like, like some sort of denial that, that we live with. We know ourselves, we know our animal and we know as soon as we see, you know, like we're not going to look at, at a kitten or a puppy who needs a home and say, oh, no, who wants no. that kid? You know, who wants that puppy? I mean, we, oh, we, why do we even go overweight. through the charade? Of, I know of, if, of the if, you, if you over intellectualize it, you can talk yourself out of anything you love, but the one thing I really do trust about myself, I mean, my brain can get all woozy and crazy and, but um, love I can trust. Well, I think that is, uh, I I think that is excellently said. Um, So I I do, but before we leave, I do want to talk about this book that you have coming out in a few weeks, but it, it occurs to me that this is probably the, the first episode of, of Curl Up with a Cat Tale, where we have done almost no talking about cats. And so I, I know that you have done some, you've done a little bit of writing about cats. Do you, do you have any cat stories or, or any experiences with cats that, that you would want to share with, with my very cat-loving audience before we, we turn to hummingbirds? Do tigers count? 
Uh, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, Ty, they're, they're big cat. I, I can tell you that there's a great love for big cats and big cat conservation, actually. among, among I, I haven't done a survey or anything, but anecdotally, I feel that there's a great deal of love for, for big cats and for big cat conservation among my readers and listeners. Boy, well, I, I did write a book called Spell of the Tiger about the man eating tigers that swim out after your boat and get on board and eat you. And I told my husband, that so not the same tigers you would find at Lion Country Safari, for example. No, no, no. But I, I told Howard not to worry. They were man eaters because actually they do mainly eat men. Uh, they, uh, the women tend to stay home where they can be eaten by crocodiles. Uh, um, fair but, enough. <laughs> they were people that knew stuff because they worshipped tigers. So your listeners, they really are onto something. The, the folks... In Chinderman, this huge mangrove swamp that stretches between India and Bangladesh for 10,000 square kilometers, it's the only mangrove swamp in which tigers live. And it's the only place where healthy tigers routinely hunt and eat people. And the people in that region worship the tigers. And they understand something about tigers that people elsewhere in the world have forgotten. And that is that predators are keeping our world whole. And they have stories that they tell that other people, scientists, for example, have dismissed as silly superstition. But I came to see as deep wisdom, they'll tell stories about how it's the tiger god that is protecting all the resources that all the people depend on in Shunderman where the baby fish grow up in their, in their nurseries. They protect the bees that make the honey that has magical powers. They protect the trees that are guarding all of Shunderman against the full force of hurricanes. And turns out, it's true. The tigers are, in fact, doing this. They're preventing the people from going out and cutting down this mangrove forest. Because if they do, they're going to get eaten by man-eating tigers. So everything these people say is true. And all of your listeners know the magic of cats. We'll take that and grow it up to a 500-pound cat, and you've got something real magical going. You know, that that actually makes perfect sense to me insofar as I think ultimately the, the purpose of religion is is to keep us humble and to make us aware that there are forces that are so much bigger than we are that are key, as you say keeping the world whole and and keeping it intact and for people who get to physically see something like that it it actually does make sense to me that they would worship these tigers who are hunting them because in in their world what is bigger than they are? You know, what is the thing that is keeping them humble and, and in check, if, if not these tigers? Um, of course, I, you know, if it, were, if it were my cat, Clayton, who was grown up to that size, um, I still feel that, that he would probably, you know, cut, cuddling to death would, would probably be the, yeah. <laughs> the, the way in which he would enforce discipline, let's say, in the ranks. <laughs> um, but but that is fascinating that that is actually fascinating although it does it does make sense to me that that these beautiful lethal creatures who who are bigger than they are and um and a danger to them would would be who they would worship Mm, yeah and that the people would understand and encode in their stories um the fact that when we intrude when we disrespect the tiger by wrecking his kingdom, then we have to pay the consequences. Well, and I think we see now, you know, in so many different ways, what is already happening through encroachment into wildlife. Uh, between, I mean, and it's everything from bears and coyotes in our backyards and menacing ourselves and our pets to, to novel zoonotic illnesses that grow yes, exactly. pandemics exactly. And, that's that's and where we got spread. this thing yeah i can't i can't believe that you know we we still allow wildlife markets to exist it's yes. crazy i yes. can't believe that we allow fur farms 
to exist. I mean, one, it is morally reprehensible, but two, it is literally a breeding ground for disease vectors. Duh. I, how stupid can we be? And yes, I, I was actually reading that that there was a, a mutation of the coronavirus that developed in a mink farm because apparently yes, minks are yes, among the very few animals yep. that can get COVID from humans well, who can me, then I get know, it back from no minks. Surprise. It's no surprise. Yeah. Crowding animals together is how you get disease. And uh, it, it's just oh God. Anyway, fur, fur farms um, really make me crazy. We had uh, ferrets as pets. They're, and they're very much like mink. They're wonderful, playful little animals. And just the idea that, that with all of the things people have to wear, that they're going to take someone's life so that they can have this outfit. And it's just incredible to me. It, it, it's, it's incredible to me. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I I have literally never. I mean, even as a little girl playing dress up, and I remember my grandmother had a mink stole, um, and and she lived with us, and and she had gotten it, you know, herself when she was a young married woman. So this was this was an older, and and my mother I think still has it. You know, she never wears it. Um, but wrapped up in in plastic in the back of a of a, a closet. But even as a little girl playing dress up, and I would dress up in my grandmother's clothes. But but I I didn't like wearing the fur. It was very it was upset. Even as a little well, kid, knowing no, nothing, well, it was upsetting it to me. From a and, uh, right? <laughs> no, I mean I I understood that it that it came from an animal like my dogs, who I loved, and wow. you know, and uh, so I I have literally never worn fur. So so I am there with you. Um, but I'm, I'm going to segue now from, from very, very large and predatory tigers to, to very, very tiny creatures, because I do want to talk for just a moment about your new book that is coming out. And it is about hummingbirds. And the title, I believe, is The Hummingbird's Gift. Yes. And that is coming out May 4th. Yeah, right around so, the corner. So if, if you're listening, uh, please, by all means, I, and, and especially if you are a fan of Cy Montgomery's other work, I would encourage you to, to pre-order this book. Um, but real quick, tell us a little bit about this book. Well, it's actually a story of resurrection. Um, not, a, you know, perfect not for the story. Easter, the, the a little bit past, but but within the <laughs> realm of the Easter season. Let's say. Well, um, it's the story of how I was privileged to help my friend, Brenda, um, who's a hummingbird rehabilitator, um, rescue, raise, and release two orphaned baby hummingbirds who beyond a doubt would have died and taking care of these little birds. And when you say, I'm sorry, when you say little, I mean, just to give us it, cause I, I have read a little bit on your website and, and in the book description about this book, but give a sense to listeners when, when you say little, how little are you talking about? They hatch out of eggs, the size of Navy beans, and they are born the size of bumblebees. So little. So these are profoundly small they are creatures. So tiny. And what they really are, they're completely made of air. They're mostly air sacs. They are bubbles wrapped in these incandescent feathers. Of course, their feathers aren't there in, until they've lived for a number of weeks. And when I first met them, they were just starting to get like little pin feathers. But you have to feed these birds every 20 minutes from dawn till dusk. If you don't feed them enough, they will starve. But if you feed them too much, like a bubble, they will pop. That is how delicate they are. So this is incredible. I mean, this is life really at its most fragile, it sounds like. It is. It is. And being able to help someone that vulnerable turn into someone as breathtaking and really magical as a hummingbird is taking a hand in a huge transformation. I mean, hummingbirds, hummingbirds, very fragility is the source of their superpowers. Do you know that the fastest bird in the world, if you're looking at body lengths is not a peregrine falcon, it's a hummingbird. The longest migrant 
bird in the world, if you're looking at body lengths of travel, is not an albatross. It's a hummingbird. And hummingbirds alone are gifted with powers of flight no one else has. They can hover. Only hummingbirds really can hover. They can hover for an hour. They can do acrobatics in the air because they are made of air. And the fact that we could take a hand in restoring to life these pathetically vulnerable little creatures and let them become essentially rulers of the sky, that to me was probably the most empowering experience I've ever had. And it's something that I think gives us all hope at a time when this pandemic is, is, has drained our faith in ourselves and in each other. But it's one of those great stories. The gift that these hummingbirds gave us was showing us that there's miracles all around us and we can be part of them. You know, one of the things that I, uh, that I really love about your work and, and about your perspective on things is that you, you always find a way, uh, you know, you write about creatures that, that most of us know something about and, and we know the basics and, and many, as in the case of hummingbirds, we observe in our own backyard. And yet you, you bring this entirely new perspective that, that I think does make your readers and, and the people who follow your work find the, these new and miraculous ways of, of looking at quote unquote everyday things and everyday animals that that really is 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 just so enriching and 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 just so beautiful and um and and so thank you really thank you so much for for the work that you do and for being here today on this podcast well go on when it's such a treat and i'm so delighted to connect with your your readers who adore you and it's, it's been great speaking with a kindred spirit. We're all in this together. And that concludes this episode of Curl Up with a Cat Tail with Gwen Cooper. Don't forget to invite your feline-loving friends to listen to new episodes along with you. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, find out how to get your name and your cat's name included in my next book, or leave comments or questions for me to answer in future podcasts, head on over to GwenCooper.com now. Thanks so much for joining me, and don't forget to hug your cat today.